Well, I've been the principal of Mansion now for 17 years and in my last term. As I look back to the time I first came here as a chaplain and then as principal, the, the thing was just the same in a way that we were trying to fulfill the founders' aims of being here in Oxford and part of it as well as in it. I think the founders were successful in their day with the means they had at their disposal, but when I was chaplain later when I became back to be principal, we weren't very successful. Our men weren't mingling in the universities, we'd hoped they would. And so we decided, soon after I came back, that we'd break the ghetto the other way around and get the university coming inside the college, and that's why we became a permanent private hall, admitting others and theologians, so that there could be inside the college a sort of dialogue sustained that would both help the theologians and the and the non-theologians. I think we've made some measure of success in this. But I should have thought that in the end we've got to reckon with the possibility of Manchester becoming a full college of university or reverting back to something like a, a, a ghetto for, for theologians. And if we had to choose, then I would always choose that we should be open. This is the sort of thing I should miss more than anything else when I go from college. I, mean, I know I should miss all the sort of settings on, but the, the morning prayers, the weekly Eucharist, I think will be the biggest deprivation of all. On a sort of superficial level, it's the, I should miss the busy telephone and front doorbell and be grateful for that. I should be able to get up in the morning and go into my study and do some work. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's going to be rather wonderful. I've written probably one or two books. I've been gathering some material from what hope would be my real contribution to theology. The theology of the Christian event. Uh, I've lectured two or three times a week, do a certain amount of tuition. Uh, and we've been able to, if it's the right word, is to buy some very good tutors lately, some of the best in the university. But this is, the, I think, one of the most wonderful things about Oxford and Cambridge, that we've got this chance to do your learning uh, within the comment of people who've gone the process before and you can see some of these snakes all around what you're saying and doing. There's a very extraordinary relationship, I think, between two different people here. Like George Eliot in Middlemarch, the novelist could not countenance growth, change and development, vitality as a force comparable to the powers of negation in stratified society. 
and the limiting effect in his art is there, I think, in Little Dorrit. In this one sense, the prison of Victorian society tainted its finest children's art as well. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, good. You've grasped very well, I think, the, cent the centrality of the prison image in, in Little Dorrit, though I think you ought to have gone further into the ramifications of it. I think also at times you've glossed over, rather, some of the very profound psychological insight of Dickens in, in Tyson. We'll come on to that. But I'd, I'd like us first yeah. to go back over this closing page or so of your essay where you find Dickens lacking in social vision. Um, I mean, it's true he's not Marx, but um, he doesn't have much sense of the progression uh, of, of society through class conflict. But I'm not sure that he's lacking, that he's so lacking, he's, he's so static a view of society as you imagine. Can I just have a look at this last page? The, 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 you say here, for example, where would it be, or about here, um, when, he fi when he, Clement, finds she, Little Dorrit, too has lost her money, then and only then will he accept her love. But this is right, think, think what happens in the novel at this point. Remember what happens when they meet in the prison. Um, in fact, Arthur doesn't, is, is, Arthur has no compunction about offering his love as such. Yeah. It's translating it into, into action, into action, yes. taking her as his wife. Yeah. Is, yeah, so it, it's Arthur who is lacking here in vitality. Yeah. Now, yeah. even so, I, I, I do think there's something rather, an element, there's a rather naive edge in what you've been saying. Um, and it's reflection, which is the other, the, the the power of society, yeah. is in that last paragraph, with the larger world left unredeemed. I mean, do we expect a novel to redeem the society it depicts? Do we expect to see such a redemption? Nathaniel Wickham was my predecessor, a, a very great ecumenist, a man of very great power and very considerable learning. Yes. And no, uh, I don't, I don't Oliver Franks. Oliver Franks. Yeah, yeah. Were you not there when that was done? Well, no. They came to the group. Queen Mother came. Did you didn't come to the stone land? No, I don't remember. Oh, no. You must have been away or something. Yes, I don't remember even hearing about it. Really? Hmm. I was there. And, uh, well, I first came to Mansfield in 1911, I suppose. So I took my, took my degree in 1911. But you've no idea how quiet England was in those days. There were no motors, there were no airplanes, and there was no um, automatic music, you see, m m m machine music, m music, um, and there, uh, there, there were no tractors on the fields. England was quiet. You could hear the larks. Which um, uh, was a uh, horse age in town when I was an undergraduate. I remember at the end of one term um, hiring a horse that I didn't know from the Randolph stables in the Hollywell. I said to the ostler, So she's pretty quiet, is she? Oh, yes, sir, unless you meet one of those motor things. Well, there was a hundred to one chance you wouldn't, you know. Or oh, was a nice way of travelling. I was telling you, Dr. Marsh, I've, I've always been told about things I've said, which I don't believe. But I'm told that uh, some told me the other day, they came up to me when I was principal and asked me if I'd been any promising young men in the college. And I said, yes, there's a young man called George Cadd. One day he will succeed Dodd. If I said that, it was one of the best remarks I've ever made, I suppose. In the course of his argument about the superiority of the Old Testament to the New, the author of Hebrews has contrasted uh, the priesthood of the Old Testament with the priesthood of Christ. And in the passage we read at the end of last lecture, he drew our attention to what he thinks to be the heart of the contrast. The Aaronic priests, he said, chapter 7, verse 16, owe their office to a system of rules based on physical descent. But Christ owes his office 
to the power of an indissoluble life. And it is to that last phrase that I want to draw your attention for the first part of this lecture. On the face of it... I came here with Barbara's lecture. The Barbara used to fill that large lecture on. And people then came from all the other colleges and the universe. That was easy. It was all they all wanted to hear what Barbara had to say. But uh, that was an extraordinary factor which kept going right through Suter, Massey, Barb, Hunter, Cadman, Caird. They were all names to come to with. Uh, and it's sort of revived even more since Caird's been here. It was back something like the dotted era when all the university and all the French people come. And this is a tribute to the to Caird and across the great part of the college. You may remember that uh, the argument already has run that if Jesus had laid claims to priesthood on earth, he would have had no title to it because he came from the tribe of Judah and not from the tribe of Levi. His priesthood, therefore, must be exercised in heaven, in the heavenly temple. because there was a good deal of corporate uh, mm -hmm. life in that small college. Mm -hmm. they, they, mm -hmm. we, we knew them all. And they yes. were really People like Philip Johnson. Like Philip Johnson? Yes. Yeah. Remember Philip? He went as a chaplain during the war. Mm -hmm. He was taken prisoner and tried to escape and was shot. Yes, you are. Yes, yes. go through the list of, about from the time I was leaving. Mm -hmm. The number of men who are in positions of uh, yes. large oh, teaching positions, true, yes. quite astonishing, but you know, I'm very struck with things. Um, enormous enlargement of life. Mm -hmm. um, these men will tell me what they're doing and what their children are doing. Yes, yes. Um, all sorts of things. They're, they're almost all opt out of the industrial rest. Yes, almost this is completely. Yeah. But the things they're doing mm -hmm. all over the world uh, were not openings when I was young. I mean, you just couldn't do yeah, those right, things. Yes, yeah. well, we had an interest in, in, in foreign missions. I mean, more interest all over the world. In that way, and there were local, there were charities which you subscribed to. Mm -hmm. But, but as for the sort of service, the life of service, no, no, this is no, 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 no,
We're going to step along the tight rope pulse of time So don't leave your books or your caps and gowns behind Sing every song that you've ever heard As we blow a cloud of colours in the world Catch the light in the warm stone Stare to the sun among the rain But not for long, not for long. All the summer's gone, summer's gone. And we're going away along the tightrope pulse of time. So don't leave your books or your caps and gowns behind. Sing every song that you've ever heard as we step into our steel and smoky world. It's a proper cottage on a small scale. Oh yes, I'm entirely in favour of it. And so, so thankful it's been carried through. And, and, and it's, it's John Marsh's great achievement. It really is a great achievement. And it really is a very great achievement. He's, uh, uh, how he's done this, I don't know. He nearly killed himself still. You see, you could only have a principal of Mansfield, which is about three men's job. If, if you were scrupulously lazy, uh, well, I had that great gift of laziness which was, uh, my predecessors had not enjoyed. They barely survived that time, you see. John Marsh has, has lived through it, he seems all right now. Yeah. 28 to 32, I was a student. When I went to Hotley Church, came back here in 38. Stayed till 49, chaplain and tutor. And then went from here to Nottingham in 49. Came back in '53, right. so it's been four years, eleven years. That's fifteen, and another seventeen. Thirty-two years of my sixty-five have been spent in this place, which is quite a chunk, really. Thank 
rest of our life is spent doing ordinary things and serving God and our neighbour as we go about our work. And this is where we fail. If Mrs Smith has stopped going to the parish church, it is more than likely not because she has lost her faith, not because she is unable to accept the theology of the vicar, much more likely because a newcomer to the district has been sitting in her pew or taking charge of her cake stall. We have important decisions to make during our lives about career, about our Christian allegiance. But sometimes, compared with the living out of the Christian faith in everyday events and opportunities, these are easy. We are more prepared to make sacrifices for large, momentous decisions, more willing to let God into the picture in making them than we are in day-to-day -day living. Reverend Principal, Reverend Chapman, ladies and gentlemen of sermon class. I asked myself, as I was sitting in the loneliness of my room, writing out these notes very quickly, if I were an American clergyman, prone as American clergymen are wont to do, to give titles to their sermons, I wonder what title I would have given to this particular sermon. All things work together for good, that would seem to be the most obvious one, but I think one, uh, perhaps, that was suggested to me by one of my brethren here this afternoon, I hope he will forgive me for using it, perhaps a little more apt. Miss Rook's cure for gloom. I say what I'm going to say now a little facetiously, and I hope it will be accepted in that way, but I would like to thank Miss Rooks for having preached the doctrine of justification. I regret as a Lutheran that it was justification by works rather than by faith, but at least that's better than mixing the two things up. sermon entirely logical. I did not find it very theological. There was little meat in it. I was unpleasantly aware of being lectured in a moralizing way. And I, if I had not been scribbling so fast, would have been soothed, perhaps, into much needed slumber. Miss Rooks tended to sway from foot to foot. I find it very difficult to classify the sermon. It has to be said that Miss Rooks did not preach the gospel, or at least not directly. It's ridiculous to say that this is a moralizing, legal type, law type sermon. Perfectly absurd. Because there's so much in this sermon that was the gospel, that was the good news, that was coming through time after time. And people that don't see it have missed an aspect of the Christian faith which is crucially important. God is working for good through these little, tiny, insignificant, sometimes evil events. That's very important to say, and people want to hear this. Now, I once saw a church where they had a cake stall, and you should have seen what that den of iniquity was like. Now, that would have made a lot of sense, and she could have worked that out with a long description, with a bit of humor. There's a sacrament about humor, it seems to me, which, for all Miss Rooks' loving kindness, I love women preachers, and warm and friendly, motherly personality which was coming out. She could have been a little harsher. Now, the reason I feel that humor is almost a sacramental nature within the Christian faith is because of the cross and resurrection. Because here, the Christians, in some sense, are the only ones who can laugh, and, and really laugh with gusto, because their salvation is assured. This certainly is the gospel, that one doesn't have to worry about one's uh, the status in life with God, that one doesn't have to worry about one's status with one's neighbor, etc., etc., and one can laugh. God's working his way with us. God can turn even the wrath of man to his praise. God, this is the great mystery. God can even turn man's sin to his own good. This is what happens, happens on the cross. And this, in the end, is what we've got here said to ourselves, because uh, far more in the end, existential for me is the frustration I put in the way of God's plans and not 
the way the events can seem to frustrate them. It's my sin that is the real difficulty. And what I want to know is really at the heart of the gospel, can God work for good through me, bloody sinner that I am? And the answer is yes, because he forgives you. Because as Miss Rooks finally said at one point, he takes you where you are. Now the gospel, the preaching of the gospel is to come to the point where you've got to say something where men have got to say, I've got nothing to offer you. Nothing in my hands I bring. And there you've got to say simply to his cross, we cling. Well, that brings us to the end of our sermon classes for this year and for my principal ship. And I think if I can just look back for a moment and say that it seems to me that as I said, I think to you before, that at this point uh, we've got a, a place where the other things we do in college can find a focus. Yeah, I think they all come out, even our common life together. It's all part and parcel of trying to live together and, and explore what it is we want to say when we say God so loved the world that he gave his son. I do not pretend to be ushering in the kingdom. <laughs> Seriously, um, two years ago, Matthew College was a, re a comparably quiet place compared to, say, the LSE. After, however, May 1968, in which, uh, or when Paris erupted, there has been a certain change in Matthew College. The left hand, uh, uh, left wing, rather, <laughs> Not this night. Um, <laughs> revolutionary element has infiltrated. I don't mean this in the in the nasty sense, but it's certainly infiltrated into the college. Change of dress in dinner, for example. <laughs> after after September 69, uh, September 68 up to June 69. In other words, uh, the year I was away, there were no gowns in dinner. Not quite no gowns. No no ties. Uh, up to the time that I'd left, there were things like visiting hours, a reflection perhaps of the general, general trend in the university. Possibly yes, but at the same time, I think that Mansfield has an important part to play in the university as a whole. For too long, I think Mansfield has uh, <laughs> labored under this, under this misconception, misconception, whew, misconception <laughs> that um, <laughs> It is a minor college, a permanent private hall. Let's talk about this inferiority complex about it. has partly be partly yeah, due to the principal John Marsh himself, who in his who in his annual pep talk to the freshers emphasizes this point that we are a we are a minor college. If this were left to itself, as I hope Dr. Kerr will do next year when he comes into office, will forget this forget this remark, thinking of Mansfield as a as a college that has aspirations to in full college office. status. So yeah. It's rather pathetic to try and be something that you're not. I mean, spending about six hundred pounds in rowing, for instance, which is all very well if you're a rich college, but just doing that in the hope of becoming a full college in fifty years' time or something is totally ridiculous. Well, is I think the major state state status in the university for for the congregation, for the professors, for the dons, comes from academic status, not from if Bansfield's got a rugby captain, a cricket captain, yeah, sure. the university captain. For the to to students, right. yes, fair, fair enough, yes, but, but not for the dons, for whom it counts. Yeah, in a place like this where the whole place is full of sort of intellectual, intellectual rejects, you're not going to get any great academic. Mm. Have to start taking the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'll draw it. <laughs> well, it should be in the Guardian, surely. <laughs> I, I first came here as, as head porter. This was when we were a few um, students, about 15, I think, 15 students living in. When I reverted to the um, first student. Uh, I, did know, uh, I did know Principal Marsh uh, as, as a student, as a matter of fact. But he was a student pastor at Marston. Uh, I don't know if he still remembers this, but um, he, he was always dropping in home for a cup of tea. You know? I mean, this is going back quite a few years, isn't it? Um, or would Jan be then in his 20s? Uh, I've always found Mansfield a very, very friendly place. And, and I think this derives from JM, right from the top, right the way down, you know. That was boring enough, but the past you went better. <laughs> well, I, I think the thing I've done, uh, I wanted to do, was get this place uh, open to non-theologians. And that's so far been done. But what is what's involved in that, I think, is the thing that this isn't really clear yet, I think, what, what it means for us to have non-theologians in. And 
Is there anything that's happened in the last oh, yeah. 20 years that you hadn't foreseen? No, all that you guys, all this student revolt, it is, yeah. is a new factor. Yeah. And in some ways, when we said we want chaps to involve themselves in the sort of discussion of the university, this is a very fair point. Mm. Uh, the and so on in the... Uh, after the... Uh, where Fairbairn was. We want these chaps in the college. I, I hope so. You've got to keep the link with the church alive and vital. I would certainly hope was yeah. uh, going to be the permanent part of the future. Yeah, of the I, I should not be greatly interested, I think, in being principal of a college no. that didn't have no. this no. strong link no. with the church. No. Uh, I would hope that the, the thing we're beginning to see happen would go further. The, the, the link with other colleges of other churches. Yeah. So the theological training here in the University of Cook is as I'd seen the last three years could, too. Uh, <laughs> become really ecumenical. Yeah. And we could begin to see the beginnings of the, of the great church, yeah. at least in the kind of training that is given to the men who are in college. Well, the Americans say play it by ear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't see your way very far ahead, I'm sure of that. From this room, for this reason, it seems to be a rather different situation now from what you oh, were. Oh, you quite again, quite again. Quite well, as you look back on this period, are there, are there things you would have liked to do that haven't? The thing I really wanted to have been done is set this college up on the line that's been set up. I'd like far more time to see that operative. And to carry, it, I would like much more to see this place recognised the ecumenical college. We haven't done that yet, but uh, well, I think there's no doubt that future generations looking back on your principalship will say this was an occasion of something big. Well, uh, the change is made. Yeah, but yeah. What about you, George? You look forward. I find it a very exciting and interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thing to look forward to. I think it's an extremely exciting time to be it is on the yeah. job. And, uh, I think I'm going to enjoy it. start with the beginning and say that it began as a theological college uh, built by congregations for the free churches when the University of Oxford was open to dissenters again in 1871. This was built in 1886. Yes, it's a proper college on a small scale. And I remember the accountant saying to me you've got about seven to ten years at most to put the college on its feet financially. They were yeah, it's quite definitely, college. because at the moment it's still old Mansfield, that place, behind New College or something. So do we expect to see such a redemption? Well, I've been through 17 years. I, you know, the times when I felt like leaving the place altogether, you know, the days when the burden has been a bit heavy. And, and, and it's, it's John Marsh's great achievement. It really is a great achievement. And it really is a very great achievement, he's you know. Last year, I have to sort of get up in the morning, go into my study, and do some work. And uh, you know, <laughs> this will be rather wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>